Welcome, it's Pax. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, who knows who we are? Yeah. Wow. Uh, so as always, about half of you are here because you've heard of us, and the other half of you are about to be really disappointed. Uh, anyway, I'm Scott. I'm Rim. And we are the hosts of Geek Nights. It's a podcast. If you want to listen to us talk for the rest of your life, that is a thing you can do. What I'll say, if you find this enjoyable, we have cards. You can find our website. There's videos of tons of other lectures from PAXs. And if you think this is terrible and you walk out, grab a card anyway so you can avoid us next year and not wait in line for nothing. Yeah, we've been at PAX every year since 08. 08. And every PAX, so... Including Australia. So if you want to avoid us, you're going to need to know who we are, because we're going to be in at least one of the panels at some point, uh, unless they kick us out. Anyway, so today we are talking about why no one will game with you, which did not fit at the top of my slide. You Sorry. specifically. We now agree. I know why they will We're now agree. All right, so why will no one game with you? Well, that's sort of a... Uh, a tricky title we came up with. We like to make tricky titles because people look at the schedule, all they see is titles, and that's how they decide what panel to go to. So you want titles like Beyond Dungeons & Dragons, The End of PC right. Gaming, Why MOBAs Aren't <laughs> Games. So uh, the title, I guess, would be more accurately described as Why You Can't Find Anyone to Game With, which is similar but not exactly the same. So in the world that we live in, there are billions of people, and most of them are gamers, right? On Steam, at any given moment, there are between 3 and 7 million people playing games. I mean, pretty much Even everyone... Even now, with everyone at PAX. Everyone here probably uses... They call themselves a gamer at some point. I am a gamer. They self-identify, even. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I, even if I think about everyone in my family, right? I try to think about everyone in your family. Moms, uncles, aunts, cousins, whoever, right? Siblings. Even if they're not nerds and they don't self-describe as gamers, you can probably think of a memory you have of that person involving games in some way, right? Everyone plays some kind of game. Even sports count, too, right? Nerds, don't be hating on sports. <laughs> sports are games, too, right? Except race walking. Right, so... <laughs> right? I mean, just Dota 2 has half a million people at any given time, and that's one game in a world where there are thousands, perhaps approaching millions of games available, right? Not just video games, every kind of game. Well, like Grandpa with his Atari, your weird yeah. aunt and uncle from the Midwest playing card games. Right, there is no shortage of gaming people on Earth because it's every single person, almost. And there's now so many internet. Shouldn't it be easier to find someone to game with with internet? You guys, there was a time when there was no such thing as online matchmaking. If I wanted to play a Quake online with someone, I had to know their phone number. I would dial up for some CNC red alert with some people from high school, right? But, you know, it's, it's like now that we have internet, not just the video games being able to go multiplayer, right? But the tabletop games. You can go on a forum, you can go somewhere and find a person and connect with them, a complete stranger. You know, I guess if you did that before the internet, what would you do? Put a classified ad in the newspaper? Yeah, that always ends well. Yeah. D&D &D game, meet at the library at 3 o'clock, see who shows up, right? <laughs> the people who read the newspaper are going to show up. Right? So, you know, there's so many gamers, there's so many internet, and there's so many packs, <laughs> including new mystery packs up there. I'm really wondering about mystery packs. I know, my money's on Chicago slash Austin. I don't have any special knowledge, that's really just where my money is. Um, yeah, we have conventions all over the place. If you look around you, I mean, you, you know, PAX is a huge convention. It's heavily advertised. It sells out, right? There are conventions pretty much everywhere. There's a Comic-Con in New Jersey today, yep. this weekend. Um, There's a million little anime cons, little gaming cons, tabletop cons. We used to go to this tiny little con that got like three or 400 people called uh, Gaming for Hope, way up in like Poughkeepsie. Oh, yeah, that was like just the college like gaming weekend with like a Child's Play charity thing going on, right? That was in like 06, I think, we did that. If you were shiftless and had nothing better to do, you could probably spend every single weekend of every year at a modern sized gaming convention. So with all these people, all this internet, and all these conventions, why is everyone LFG? Why is it so hard? Why are there so many people in the tabletop area alone with a game just looking for someone to play with them? Why are there so many? Why does every forum on every community, everywhere on the internet, have the trying to form a game thread or help me, my gaming group fell apart and I need a new one thread? Right, why is that? Why are we always talking about how this? How many times do you sit down at your computer to play a game that isn't Dota 2 and you just can't find, you know, all the servers are empty or you found a game but it wasn't good so you tried to go to a different server or... You know, who knows what, right? You, you call your friends, to tr you people you know to try to get a game together, it doesn't happen, right? Why is it so hard, even though there has never been in the history of the world more people alive at once, right? More games and more ways to connect with people, you still can't find a game. 
Well, imagine this pie, this tasty pie from some nice man. Dan Parsons took this photo. Great, thanks. <laughs> um, I wonder if he made the pie. Creative Commons license is awesome. Totally awesome. Uh, yeah, imagine that pie is all of the gamers on Earth that you could potentially play a game with, right? We're going to go and eat away at this pie because it's so tasty and see how many people are left after we go through all the reasons why they're not going to play with you. Reason number one, geography. Yeah, so a lot of people in Germany play German board games. Uh, not so easy for me to play German board games with the people in Germany. They're kind of far away, and they're not awake when I'm awake. So already, that huge pool, that's like the center of the kind of board games that I like. The people who are most into those games don't live anywhere near me. How many people wanted to come to PAX and just lived too far away, and they couldn't get here? Or it sold out, right? Um, but, you know, I'm, we're lucky enough to live in New York City. When I lived in the sticks, right, and I was a high school kid. He considers places like Boston to be the sticks. Don't, it is don't. the sticks. So, um, right, when I grew up in the suburbs of Connecticut, right, without a car, just some high school kid, it's like the only people to game with are the nerds who happen to live in your town, right, who happen to be, you know, in your high school that you know. It's so like even nerds like a grade under me, I didn't know who they were. We couldn't game with each other. I think every Dungeons and Dragons role-playing group ever, the first group that everyone forms is in middle or high school where by chance you find out that there's three other people in your class who have those same weird books that they've been reading for 10 years but can never find someone to play with. So by default, you play with them. No matter who they are, no matter what they're into, you play with them because they live in your town. Right? So, and then, you know, when you consider, like, the, the reasonable transportation distances, whether you're in a place where people have cars, right, where you'll maybe get to, you can drive pretty far, right, reasonably to play, you know, a serious day of gaming, right? Or, but, you know, if you're stuck with, like, trains, your radius shrinks, but you're probably in a city that has more population density, right? But, so now already, like, 99% of the people on Earth are out of your gaming radius. If you're doing, if you're doing the tabletop physical in-person game, Yeah, right? all these, like, I can't play with the people in Germany because physically the pieces are not there. I'm not going to mail the board back and forth. <laughs> but geography has other issues, even for games that are not physically in the same space. Like latency. So let me tell you a story. When I first got a cable modem, it was a test rollout when, as a kid in Michigan, and I had Quake. And I connected to a server, and I tried to play a Quake 1 deathmatch. This was amazing to me at the time. And I hit the button to fire a missile, and then like a second or two later, the missile flew out. And I got really mad, and I didn't know what was happening. So I go to a BBS, and I posted my problem, like it was a bug. And someone responded, LOL, noob, that's lag. <laughs> and then I learned all about ping. Yeah. So, I mean, your phone, like my phone right here, has incredible amounts of bandwidth, considering that it's like this wireless device connected to a cell tower outside, right? But what it has tremendous amounts of as well is latency, right? That, you know, I'm going to get a ton of packets coming in per second, right? So I can watch a YouTube video, but that YouTube video is not going to start playing for like a second. Right? So a second's not a big deal for pressing play on a YouTube video, but for shooting a bullet in Counter-Strike, that is a tremendous problem if it charges an entire second later, right? Even more than like 100 milliseconds is intolerably bad. Now software has gotten better. The, the way to deal with this, the algorithms are much better than they used to be, but once you get competitive, once you get to the higher levels, it still matters so much that it's almost an intractable problem. You'll see in competitive gaming that teams that are very far apart from each other have difficulty arranging games, and the games that they play in the opposite regions are very unfair and one-sided much mm -hmm. of the time. This is why international competition is such a big deal because like people who've never played each other in like a fair competition are now in the same place playing on a land with no lag and it's like oh my god who's better we don't know they've never played yeah people in Australia who learn that I'm actually really good at Counter-Strike yeah um, but yeah so this really only applies to real-time games right if you have a turn-based game online latency also doesn't matter because like I take my turn it doesn't matter if that turn takes an hour to get to you well maybe it does but most of the time it doesn't. You just check your email. Oh, someone took their turn. I'll take my turn. So this is something that's removed a class of games from play. Now, there's a class of games that I can't play with people who are far away because of latency, but it doesn't affect all games. So mm -hmm. Time zones. Time zones are a big problem, right? Maybe I got really fast internet, right? But I live in the western part of the eastern time zone, and my friend who lives across the street is an hour behind, right? <laughs> that's a problem. Right? But an hour is really not a problem. What is a problem is even just the three hours to California, right? Is I'm playing a game on Google Hangout, the tabletop RPG. We use the webcams. It works out great. Everyone's having a good time. One player is in California. Only a three hour difference, right? How big a deal is a three hour difference? When he, was the last time you played that game? Yeah, right. Exactly. Right? So he gets home from work at five, 
for me, it's already eight. You're playing a tabletop RPG. It's going to take three, four hours. We're going to bed at midnight. For him, it's like nine. All right? It's no problem. Right? So these are almost like latency, as we talk about, is in a game. I try to click on the head. The head moved before I click, you know, that sort of thing. This is like uber latency. This is the latency that prevents turn-based games from working. I take my turn, and now there's a lag time of a full day before someone else can take their turn. Yeah, my, the other guy, his, 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 he has to go next, and he's sleeping. So we had to wait for him, right? Whereas I'm good for three or four more hours. If he would just stay up late, everything would be solved. Or we could game, I could wake up at four in the morning and start gaming, too. That would work. Language. Parlez-vous français? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> he was just in Paris like yesterday. Yeah, I flew so. in direct. I'm a right. little, a little tired. Sorry, French people. Now this is. Uh, does that, I'm just curious. Are you guys too young to know what that is? I'm not going to explain the rest. I'm sure someone knows what it is. It's okay. Serious. Okay. But. This doesn't affect all games. Like, German board games, even, you'd think there'd be a very big language barrier, but often there isn't, because the kinds of people who play those games understand the mechanics, and they translate the rules, and they don't talk other than about the game, so it's fine. But you want to play Dungeons & Dragons with someone who doesn't speak English? <laughs> That's going to be a problem, right? It's like, you can play Counter-Strike with pretty much anyone on the opposing team, but if they're on your team, you might need to talk to them, right? So, like, Rim, you were playing with, like, Canadians? Oh, yeah, French so there's Canadians? all these Quebecois dudes. Just when I play Counter-Strike, there's always all these Quebecois people on the servers. They don't speak any English, or if they do, they pretend they don't. They talk to each other in French. They coordinate with themselves in French. So we play a competitive match. We go. They yell a bunch of stuff in French, and then I'm off by myself, and I die alone in the corner with a smoke grenade. <laughs> But you can use, the game at least has the little radio commands, so you can be like, circle around back. And that's all you can say, because when on their computer they hear, circle around back. <laughs> who, knows what, who knows what they're hearing, right? Tribes 2 actually had the, the, the voice system. Shaz Tribes 2 actually had a very interesting system to get around this. You could construct entire sentences with this pretty clever menu system. Like you press V to open up the voice menu, so and there was tons, like menus and menus of... You'd customize it. I type like VRTD, and then it would tell everyone, and whatever language, you know, circle around to the back to pick up the weapons depot that I just dropped. Thanks. Doesn't work for every game, not available in every game. And for, role, for games that are content and story heavy, this is pretty much a deal breaker. Mm -hmm. And it's not just la language, we don't just mean being able to communicate with the other people, right? Language can also keep you from physically playing a game. For example, let's say I was fluent in Korean. I'm not. Right? And there's a Korean game I wanted to play. Well, I can read Korean. Why? That shouldn't be a problem, right? You need to sign in to most Korean online games a Korean social security number in order to sign in. There was a black market for those when we were in college to play certain terrible MMOs. We would buy them from people and they would let us use them to log in. So, you know. <laughs> So it's like, it's, you know, it's like language, but also nationality as a whole. It's like you're sort of going to be stuck to people in your country. We're sort of lucky in that a lot of, we're very lucky that, you know, English is becoming sort of the world language, or Chinese probably also, mm -hmm. right? And that's about it. You know, if you lived and grew up in a small place that had, let's say, Turkey, and you spoke Turkish, right, as not a lot of people, relatively speaking, right, to play games with. Oh, look at that pie. It's we've eaten a lot we, of the pie already. I'm kind of worried. I think we've ate more of the pie. I think, you know, I don't know. I think it's a different pie, actually, but yeah. Yeah, that's Sage Ross's pie. <laughs> it's an okay pie. <laughs> They're so tasty. Look oh, at those God. apples. Let's eat some more pie. <laughs> we should eat some more pie. All right. So let's say you've surmounted everything we've already talked about. You found people who speak a language you speak. They live near enough to you for latency isn't an issue. Maybe they even live in your town. You've got a place you can meet regularly. You've solved every problem we've talked about. But I play fighting games. I play Counter-Strike. This isn't going to work, I don't think. <laughs> I feel like we're giving dating advice at this point. <laughs> Right? It's like, you know, there's plenty of people at PAX. Look around this PAX, right? And I see sometimes at PAX something that upsets me, and that's people who are focused on one kind of game, right? You'll see people, it's like they're a fighting game person. Smash Brothers Melee only. Right. Fox only. It's like they're in that console, they're in that console free play, and they're playing fighting games. And you know what? Fighting games are awesome. I'm down with that, right? But to only play fighting games to the exclusion of all other kinds of games is a little bit, you know, narrow-minded. Right? Is I like to play all kinds of games. There are some games I play more than others, of course, the games that I prefer, whatever. But I play a fighting game once in a while. I play an FPS once in a while. I play an RTS, even though yeah. I suck really bad at them. Right? I'll play a tabletop. I'll play all kinds of games. But right? like, I don't play a lot of MOBAs. They're just not my bag. So as a result, 
a lot of people who I could otherwise play a game with here at PAX even, if all you're playing right now is MOBAs, we're never going to play a game together. Or you're going to be really mad at me, and then we're not going to play a game together. <laughs> Right? So, yeah, this is, this is a huge problem, is that, you know, you found people. The hardest thing to do is to find the people, and then, even though they're gamers, and even though they're cool, and even though you get along, they're not your gamer, and you're not theirs, right? You're, you're separated by what you want to do. Now, this is not a new problem, and if you read old Dragon magazines about Dungeons & Dragons from, like, the 90s, they would talk about how Magic the Gathering is ruining Dungeons & Dragons. Because people would show up at D&D night, and half the group wouldn't want to play D&D. They'd want to play Magic instead, and then the group would fracture. So we still haven't solved this. That was a real concern, and it still is. <laughs> Differences of game! All right. We both, play the, we both play fighting games. We both play nothing but fighting games. I only play Bushido Blade. I only play Street Fighter. It's not going to work out. No, I don't think so. <laughs> Right? So you, you, even harder, right? Maybe you're playing League of Legends and your friends are playing Dota. It's almost the same freaking game. 90% the same. But you can't play with them because they just play this different game than you. Just because that's what they decided, right? You didn't start playing the same game together, right? And this, any kind of game that is popular, there's going to be a competing game. D&D Pathfinder. It's the same damn game. But you know what? If, if, they don't, if the other guy doesn't want to play D&D and you don't want to play Pathfinder, it's not going to happen. Why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> well, because people get invested. I mean, you, you play a certain game. Like, I keep using Counter-Strike as my example because I play a lot of Counter-Strike. You like that game specifically. There might be other games that are very similar, but that one's yours. That's the one you've played. That's the one you're used to. And there's value in branching out in other directions, but at the same time, if you really like D&D, &D, you probably really want to play D&D, &D, even if you're trying all the Burning Wheel and all the other cool RPGs that do different things. Mm -hmm. I mean, with any game that you're going to play that you care about enough to, like, set up multiplayer play, you know, you're going to play with other people, is a game you've invested in. Not only learning the game, practicing the game, you know, reading rules, increasing your skills, right? You've put a lot of time into that game. If I put a lot of time into Counter-Strike, right, I need to get my investment out of that, right? As I practiced at this, I need to play it. If all my friends suddenly decide to play Call of Duty, it's like... I invested everything in Counter-Strike, I'm so good at it, and now you're going to ask me to play this other thing, and I lost. All that time was wasted if I'm going to play this other thing now, right? So it's like you, you separated yourself before you knew what the right game to play was. You already made the mistake, and now what do you do? Now, this also covers the balkanization. Tabletop games have this especially. There's a ton of tabletop games. So the common problem people have is that the reason they're always looking for games is that every time you want to play a tabletop game at a convention, in person, anywhere, at least one dude does not know the rules. So every game becomes a teaching game, which is good. That's great. That's a great part of our gaming culture. But at, at the least same someone time, who's willing to learn a new game, exactly. right? And not being stubborn and only wanting to play the game they wanted to play. But if we all always play different games, then every game you ever play will be a teaching game, and you'll never get to play the mastery level of any game as a result. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, you know, it's, we all like to play all kinds of different games, and I even said before, playing a variety is good. Don't be single-minded. But you still want to have some games that you play more often than others so that you can experience that higher level of actually figuring a game out, getting really good at it, right? If every game you play is you're playing it for the first time, it's basically a life of tutorials, right? You're never going to really play that awesome game where everyone knows what they're doing and it's, it's you know, a huge fight to the finish and see who's really better at it. I've actually seen that drive people out of tabletop areas of conventions over the years. Mm -hmm. Dead games. So, Nidhogg. Uh, this happens to a lot of games, but Nidhogg is a great example. This is a great two-player versus, like, Atari-style game, like Combat or Outlaw. I love the shit out of this game. When it came out, I bought it immediately. I bought it immediately. We said, hey, let's get together and play. So we played. It was super fun. Uh, fast forward, like, two weeks, I go to the leaderboards, or the matchmaking system to play. There are seven people. So I play against all of them. One by one, they rage quit. And then eventually, they all start quitting, and then I'm the only one there. And anyone who logs in immediately fights me and then leaves. Fast forward another two weeks, I haven't seen someone in the matchmaking since. This game is dead. I bought it. No one will ever play it with me it's again. It's super new. It's only like, what, a couple months old? Yep. And, and it's already dead. It had two weeks where everybody was playing it. And now I defy you to find a consistently running game of this. At Geek Nights, we tried to set up a worldwide tournament. <laughs> Seven people have signed up for this tournament. <laughs> I mean, you could probably set this up physically at PAX and get people to play it, 
right? But, you know, try to get it at your house. Maybe it'll suffice for a game night at your house. But you're not going to get people to regularly go for this. The game has died. There's no community built up around it. There's no excitement online anymore. It came out, there was excitement, and then you haven't heard of it since. Now, some games live on in this sort of undead twilight. Like, Tribes 2 died. But yet, there's a very tiny, very dedicated core of people who keep Tribes 2 going. Five on these people. Crazy, dedicated, hard to access servers. But these are like hidden insular communities almost. So the games, even if you think, oh, well, I'll just run a server forever, you'll run a server forever, and the same five people will log in forever. And if they don't happen to be you know, online at the same exact time that you're online, in the same time zone with good latency, yeah. right, it's just not going to happen. Um, but yeah, dead games, it's like, why, why do games die? I guess people just move on to a different game. But some or... games never die. Counter-Strike has not died yet. Right. Iterate, I mean, Counter-Strike 1 to 6 still has millions of people playing it every day. That's ridiculous. Right. But, you know, this goes along with what we were saying, you know, differences of game, differences of genre, right? You invested so heavily into some game, right? Rim invested heavily into Nidhogg, and then it died. So it's not even that no one else wanted to play it with him. It's that the game... Didn't want to play with it. Dance Dance Revolution, not super, super popular anymore. I tried to buy, I wore out one of my dance pads, I tried to buy another one. They don't make those things anymore. The official ones are gone. You gotta buy these awful Chinese bootlegs, and I wonder how many of those are still being manufactured. I wonder how many chemicals get released when you step on those. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, wow, we ate a lot of pie, and yeah. we've only been talking for like 20 minutes. So, our game is still alive. Mm hmm. We're playing it with, there's a bunch of people playing it. Everyone's playing it. There are servers. We're playing it with people who speak our language in our time zone. We're going to eat the rest of this pie real quick. <laughs> this pie is, is not long for this world. Uh, <laughs> that guy. <laughs> we'll so, talk more about that guy. Yeah, we're not talking later. about that guy yet. Not yet, right? But we are talking about his, his personalities of people, right? You found some people, you're playing the same game, you live in the same town, everything seems to match up so far, but you're just, you just don't get along personally, right? Yeah. For whatever reason. They're re they take the game super hardcore serious. They don't want to have, they want to talk at all while they're playing the game. If you start talking about like, oh, I saw this movie last night, they're like, focus on the game. Nice. <laughs> I'm, I'm that guy. Right, maybe, you know, and there's, there's all kinds of things that can drive people apart, you know, political differences or just, I don't know, any number of things, right, where two people just plain don't get along, right, for whatever reason that is. Now, there's an interesting phenomenon I've noticed, and it was pointed out to me by someone from overseas who was living in Berlin who came to the U.S. and went to a convention with us. We were playing tabletop games, and afterward, he said, what was anyone's name in that game? And I was like, oh. Yeah. And then he asked everyone, like, what's your name? What's your... No one knew the names of anyone they played tabletop games with at conventions. People didn't even introduce themselves. Or if they did, they forgot the names immediately, played the game, and then got the hell out of Dodge. <laughs> and I think that's because we've already, if we're already desperate, if, we, if the pie that's left is so small, we'll put up with a lot in the people we play games with. If I find someone who will play Nidhogg, and they otherwise are probably an abhorrent person... I might let a lot of things slide just so I can keep playing Nidhogg with them. Just have to make sure they don't figure out my real name or my email address. <laughs> well, I mean, another thing, right, is that you're worried, you might be worried that this is going to drive you apart, right? You sit down at a table with some strangers and you're going to play a game with them, right? If they find out, you know, you don't know what they, their kind of person they are and they don't know what kind of person you are. If you reveal too much, you might drive this game apart and lose that piece of pie that you fought so hard for, that was so rare and so difficult to obtain, right? So you keep that part, you know, at, a, at least an anonymous convention game, you keep all of that stuff hidden, right, and protected, so that there's no way this game will cease to happen. You don't sit down at every table and be like, so what do you think about atheism and Obama? <laughs> right? That's not going to happen. Right? So yeah. So not only do you have to find people living near you, playing the same game as you, right? It had to be a person that you can get along with, right? Wow, this is getting hard, guys. Even temporarily. Right, even for five minutes. Now, temporarily is fine, but what if you're trying to form a D&D &D group? <laughs> that guy's coming over every week. Every other week. <laughs> Eating all the sun chips. Okay. All right, now this, this is actually, this is sort of serious and sad, right? This is serious, like, it sucks, but not everyone has the same amount of money. I mean, you guys already, PAX privilege. We're all at PAX. A lot right. of people, even if badges didn't sell out, they just can't afford to get here. 
I mean, it's, you know, this is the world we live in. It's the reality. I mean, we're not going to sit here and talk about how socialism would be great and they should just give everyone the same amount of money or whatever, right? But not everyone has the same amount of money, right? So if you want to play Magic the Gathering and your friends want to play Magic the Gathering and they live with you and your town and everything's great, you get along, and you have mad money and they don't, you can afford all the Magic cards and they can't. You're really not going to be able to play Magic with them. Or the board games. A lot of the board gaming communities in towns focus around one person because it's the one guy or the one girl. We say guy or dude a lot. It doesn't. That guy could be a girl. <laughs> Often is. But there's one person who owns all the board games because it's the only person who has a lot of money and is into gaming. So even if you hate that dude, you got to go to him if you want to play games. He becomes like this tiny godfather of gaming. <laughs> He's arbiting out games like, okay, we can play that expensive new German game. I just got four copies of it. Let's play it tonight if everyone comes to my house. Right. I mean, you know, what about that, you know, that kid in elementary school? He didn't have an NES when everyone else did, and he could only play it when he went to other people's houses. I was more mad at that kid who had the Neo Geo. <laughs> That's the kid with too much money. That's a separate problem, <laughs> right? But this, this seriously drives people apart, and not just in gaming, but in other social situations, right? I, there are a lot of people I'm really good friends with, and it's like, we'll want to eat at a restaurant that they can't really afford to eat at right now, right? Or we'll want to go to a convention, and they can't afford the transportation to get there, right? It's like, on occasion, I can help them if I can, but you know, I'm not mega rich. I'm just you know, slightly more well off than they are. Right? But the, so think about how the, the experience of being a gamer is so different. It was different levels of money. We're not gonna lie, we have a lot of money. We fly to every PAX, we go everywhere. We go to all these gaming cons. So if this PAX, like I don't find a good game or it doesn't go that well, whatever. I'm gonna be at PAX Prime in a few months and then I'll be at PAX Australia. Then I'll be back at PAX East and whatever mystery PAX and mag PAX. Okay, vice president, coming <laughs> flying in from Paris. <laughs> So as a result, uh, to me, I think, oh, it's really easy to find gamers because I see so many conventions, so many games, and I, I'm not really tied to local places. I'm not, I don't have my one convention that has to go perfect because that's the only time every year I get to play games. So my view on gaming is very skewed and very different. It's very easy to lose sight of the fact that for a lot of people, Apex is literally the only time every year they get to play games in person with friends, with people who like the same things they like. Do not waste your time at PAX, like sitting here, it's a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> right? But like I see so many people at PAX spending hours like waiting in line in the expo hall or something, right? It's like, don't do that. You can, any minute you have free, you should be playing a game, right? Eat the pie before one of these other thousands of people eats it, right? Because it's not me around for long, right? So yeah, money is bullshit, world sucks. <laughs> Air right. hockey problem. So Air hockey is the best. We'll toot our own horn on another front. I think we're better at air hockey than anyone in this room. There might be an air hockey pro in this room, in which case that would is not there? be Is there? Do any of you play air hockey professionally? Or semi-professionally? <laughs> no, I didn't think so. Okay, yeah. good. We don't play air hockey professionally or semi-professionally, but we play it seriously and we play it a lot. Like whenever there's a decent air hockey table, we play a lot of air hockey relative to a normal person. Right? <laughs> so as a result, we're okay at air hockey, better than most people. So if we play air hockey against someone who doesn't play it every chance they get, they just lose. Right? But if we play against a pro, we just lose. So we enter this sort of twilight zone of gaming where there's literally no one in the world at our level to play. And uh, the same thing happens with fighting games. You'll see this in a fighting game community. You and your friends all start playing Street Fighter VIII when it comes out. And you're all having fun. And then one dude... One night, plays for an extra four or five hours, practices some combos, suddenly he's the master. Everyone else either it's has to... It's untouchable, be right? Not even the master. Like, it's, compl it's not only like you can't beat him, you can't hit him. When we play Street Fighter, Scott will just walk in with M. Bison. He's like, all right, I'm only using jabs this time, Rim. Come on. <laughs> and I suck ass at fighting games, right? When I play someone who's actually good at fighting games, they beat me with jabs only. Right? And it, it's, it's literally that dramatic with a lot of competitive types of games, right? Even air hockey. It's like, what do I do in air hockey? It's nothing special. I hit the puck directly at the goal over and over and over again. <laughs> Straight on. Right? Occasionally at an angle. Yeah, most people can't do that. They're just, they just try to hit the puck to keep it away from the goal, right? They're moving their puck way away from their goal, leaving it wide open. They make the mistake of using the kind of standard English grip instead of the tournament two-finger. Right. <laughs> so you found your friends. 
you live in the same town, all that stuff, you're playing the same game, and one person is way better or way worse than everyone else, and now it's not fun to play with that person or across. It's not fun for either one of them. I mean, me boxing Mike Tyson is not fun for me. <laughs> or for Mike Tyson. Yeah, I mean, he just beat up some kid. <laughs> he would feel bad. Really, uh, you know, even though he's not the greatest person, I think he would still feel bad if he just punched your face in. Right? Yeah. You know, or even any respectable, like, an MMA, any MMA person, right, fighting you would be like, no, I'm not doing this. this yeah, is I'm not, not going to hit you. Right, unless they were evil. But we call it the air hockey problem because it, not all gamers experience this. This is a specific problem that occurs when you double down on a game, when you try to win. As soon as you actually, and we've done other lectures on how to win at games because most of you are not trying to actually win. If you actually try to win and you follow through on that even a little bit, this will happen to you, and you will lose all your gaming friends in that game almost overnight. Or what usually happens more often is everyone still wants to game together, right, to, to keep whatever pie they have left, but you just won't play that game anymore. So you have a group of friends, you all play StarCraft, or you're all pretty much at the same skill level, don't level up faster than everyone else, and don't, and also keep up with everyone else. Otherwise, if one person makes it unfun, for the rest of the group, it's like, oh, no one wants to play against Rim at that game anymore. You just won't play that game anymore, and everyone will move to a different game entirely just to keep gaming happening. Now you think, oh, well, I'll just get good enough to play at the low levels of the competitive circuit, and you can do that. But now you've got to go to a PAX and join the tournament for that game and spend your entire convention playing that game. Mm -hmm. So now you become that guy in that game. Air hockey is your only thing. And that's the only way to get to those high levels unless you're some sort of like timey wunderkind. Yeah, I mean, I've been playing for about a year. I've been playing Netrunner a lot and I've gotten good, right? And I've won like a couple tournaments. But you know what? My friends don't play Netrunner. I've had to go find other people to play Netrunner with, right? And there's a Netrunner tournament at PAX. I feel like I'm getting sort of shamed here. Yeah. <laughs> there's a Netrunner tournament at PAX tomorrow. That thing is scheduled. I don't hope it doesn't last this long from 11 to 8. You know what I'm doing? I'm going to go through 11 and play, and if it takes too long, I'm just going to quit because no one's got time for that at PAX. <laughs> 11 to 8? Are you kidding me? Well, you know who has time for it? The people who only play Fox Final Destination No Items. Sure, those guys. <laughs> Whatever. And that's right? a fine thing, but look how it reduces your pool. So even if you've got your gaming group, great. If you just push a little too hard, a little too far, you destroy it all around you. You destroy your own little gaming right. world. And now that I've been playing Netrunner for a year, it's like even if I get rimmed, to play a couple games, he just loses immediately. And then I get discouraged. Right, I don't I'm not, I'm not gonna like let him win, but he's not gonna learn anything. If you play basketball against Michael Jordan, are you gonna learn anything about basketball? No. You're not gonna learn any, you're gonna learn, I can't, you're not even gonna learn how to take a shot because you're not gonna get a shot off. There is an escape from this, the teaching game. For example, I enjoy teaching people games. It's fun to teach people a game, take them through it, but it's not the same as playing the game. Playing a game with a bunch of people who haven't played it before is a very different experience from playing a game with people who are all serious. If Scott and I play air hockey, we're just silent. You just hear nothing but the pata clink, 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 clink. But if we're playing with anyone else, all right, so you want to hold it like this. You want to, it's such a different experience that it's not even playing the game in a sense. It can be enjoyable, but I'm not getting the gaming experience that yeah, I Yeah, if I open up a video game and I choose tutorial, right, and that's all I do, can you say I played the game? No, you really can't, right? That's why the next menu item is play. They don't consider the tutorial to be playing. It's something different. They do give you an achievement for it, though. Mm. Sure. Oh, yeah. Does anyone know who that is? Someone knows who it is. Oh my god, really? Are. Raise your hand if you know who that is. Nerds. Nerds, okay. <laughs> this, is, this is Herm Edwards, right? He was the coach of the Jets at one point, and it was basically in, the fo in, in football, right? Okay, football. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's not a lot of kicking, but there's a little bit. Um, so he was the coach of the Jets, and they were really, really bad. Really bad that year when he was the coach. So at a press conference, which is required after every football game, uh, someone asked him, like, hey, uh, are you going to lose on purpose for the rest of the season to get better draft picks? Because basically the way it works is the suckier your team is, you get better draft picks next year so that you'll get better players so that you'll be good next year, maybe, right? So go on YouTube. And it just would be look. unfair if the Super Bowl champions got to bring in the best college players to join their team, right? That wouldn't work out. Yeah, it's like if you, if, you win a if you win a game in a MOBA, they just give you more levels for the next game. Right. It's like, no, then the guys who won the first game wins the second one, right? It goes the opposite way. So go on YouTube and just look for, you play to win the game, in quotes, and you'll find tons of videos of the incident we're talking right. about. Right, so here. they asked him this question, and he's like, what? Right? He's like, no, you play to win the game, even though it would have been, I guess, in the... In a multi -year, in the meta game, in the meta game, the multi-year strategy for his team would have been to lose on purpose for the rest of the football year. But he was too proud, and he also, you know, <laughs> liked playing games. And his attitude was, "I play to win the game, no matter what." That was his attitude, 
right? Well, what if he's playing against someone whose attitude is I'm losing on purpose? How many of you have been in a game of, I don't know, Cards Against Humanity, where, you know, people are doing their thing, but there's one person who's seriously trying to win with win? the points? Because you can win Cards Against Humanity? Kind of can. <laughs> kind of? Yeah. Or Apples to Apples, those games. The games where you play these story games, board games, where one person is trying to win, and everyone else is just hanging out and having fun. Those games don't go very well, and either the person who's trying to win will get frustrated because everyone else is just like giving the game away or not actually playing to win, thus preventing them from winning, or the people who are just playing to have fun suddenly are sort of confronted with this angry person who's yelling at all of them to take their turn mm -hmm. over and over again. <laughs> Why are you looking at me? I'm not the slow one. The slow one's over there. Wrong Scott. <laughs> right? But it's not just, you know, there's other attitudes about gaming besides winning and losing. For, you know, perhaps play styles, right? One person might have a particular play style. They like to play the game, you know, sort of, you know, maybe they like to rush, right? And another person gets really annoyed against rushes. They like to play slow. And it's like, well, it's, it's not going to work, right? It, you know, sometimes you play like an RTS and people be like, don't attack for three minutes or something like that. And it's like, no, I don't play that way. Right. You know, you'd see this in the old uh, RTSs like Command and Conquer, especially, where you'd see a lot of people make a little server or start playing the game, and they'd say, all right, guys, no attacking for 20 minutes. Because they want to play this other game. They want to play a slow game. They can't really enforce it inside of the game. So, of course, I would join those games just immediately send tanks. And this happened, you know, I think the place where you can see gaming attitudes the most is in the tabletop RPG, right? D you're going to have something like D&D, &D, and half the people at the table, they love to tell froofy stories about elves. <laughs> oh, we went to the courts. Well, specifically Everestkin elves. Right, yeah, sure, right? And they're telling all their proofy elf stories. But this guy, he doesn't care about no proofy elf stories. He doesn't care about stories at all. He just wants to kill monsters in the dungeon and get the loot. That's what we want. Treasures. How many treasures am I getting? What level am I? You know, which, I'm going three, five footsteps to the left, and then I'm casting magic missile, right? It's the same game, 100% the same game. We got together to play it. Right? But our attitude about the game is different. We have a different style, we want something different from the game. If we play it together, there's only going to be some kind of conflict and it's not going to work out too well. So, <laughs> I play Pokemon, I got Pokemon right there. I got Pokemon right there, who's got Pokemon? Yeah, Pokemon. Yeah, so let, let's all go to the local elementary school and play Pokemon. Because <laughs> that'll go over super well with everybody's parents. <laughs> Right? There are certain games that you can play where the, you know, I guess the community for that game is a significantly different age from you. Now, I'm not a fan of age discrimination, but yeah, you probably shouldn't be inviting like the 12-year-olds over to your house to play Pokemon. <laughs> that would be weird, guys. <laughs> Unless you're 12, in which case, don't invite the 30-year-olds over to your house <laughs> to play Pokemon. Right? Now, it, it's a little bit okay if you go to the local gaming store for like the Pokemon card game tournament and you're 30 and there happen to be 12 year olds there. That's a, it's like on the borderline. Now, it is interesting <laughs> because there's, there's different culture and different types of games. So, you know, the genres and types of games we talked about earlier. So, in the Dungeons and Dragons, like role playing community, I remember when I was a kid in the 80s, my parents would just drop me off at gaming conventions in Michigan. And I was, you know, like 12, 14, and I would play mostly with these 40 and 50 year old dudes in their like scripted scenario D&D tournament type games. And that, I guess, was totally okay. Yeah. I mean, you, know, you, you go to a Netrunner tournament, right? There's usually like one kid there, yep. right, who's playing, but it's like, that's a hard game. Usually, you know, people who aren't like in college age or higher can't like understand all the rules. It's like, it's really hard. Now, what if you're differences of age and you're in Australia? Well, now you're just fucked. <laughs> I mean, you have to wear wristbands at PAX to prove your age to even get into different areas of the convention just because of the laws there. Sure. But age has other factors besides just sort of like the appropriate content of the game, right? It's like sports. You can't be having 12-year-olds play baseball with pretty much anyone who's not a 12-year-old. There was that South Park with the Red Wings. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right? Anyone who's seen the episode knows going on, right? Certain games are just age brackets. Even Pokemon, if you go to like the legitimate Nintendo Pokemon tournaments, they have age brackets, right? If you're old, you're only going to play with old people. You're not going to play with kids. They don't allow that. There's a you know, complete separation. Now, there is a reality that people have hit different de developmental milestones at different ages, and there's certain stages your brain goes through. So, frankly, kid brains just can't play certain kinds of games, or they can't play them very well. No matter how smart you think the eight-year-old is, he's not going to be able to fully comprehend Hanabi unless he's some sort of, like, genetic Savant. genius. I mean, there are... There's, there's, Those it's rare. Exist. It's they're rare. rare. It's like a crumb in the pie, 
Right. Like, we played a game of Hanabi, actually. We're at the Anime Boston, not that long ago here in Boston. And two young kids were there, and we wanted to play a game. So we called them over, and we showed them Hanabi, and we taught it to them in the tabletop area. And they were really smart kids. They were really cool. They played the game really well. But at the same time, their kid brains didn't 100% get the game. There, there was no way we could teach them to play the game as well as someone who was even five or six years older. There's just that that's the reality of the world. I guess if we had played the game with them many, many, many times, right, then maybe they could have eventually gotten but it. But even then, certain or things we, are Or if unlikely. we played it enough, they would age while we were playing. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like we play it until they're 20 and then they've got it. Right? Or like to, to do a complete aside on a sport, skiing. Kids who are below a certain age just don't have the fine motor control to be able to do the things you need to do to ski. So they can ski, but it's pretty much just brownie in motion. They're going down the hill one way or another. <laughs> you know, there's also the fact that, you know, people of different ages, right, I think more so than any other factor, have, you know, different things excite or interest them, right? So maybe you're playing Agricola with some kids, and they get it. They're like these really smart kids who really love the game, but they just get distracted by the cute sheep. So they're like, sheepy, sheepy, sheepy. That happens to me sometimes. I do that too, yeah. But you know, we're you got to stack the sheep up in a complex stacking arrangement. Right. Now, this is also a problem of differences in maturity, and it doesn't necessarily have to do with age. It's the sort of. <laughs> well, I guess we know where we are. <laughs> so. One, I wouldn't play that with an eight-year-old. But two, like in my gaming group, you know, it's PAX. We say fuck a lot. We're from New York. When we play games. Like, to the point that relatives who aren't from New York notice that I, we say fuck a I don't lot. even notice when I say it. I only notice people reacting that I say it. And I'm like, oh, right, you're not in New York. So... <laughs> Even if someone's my age, if they're bothered by uh, crude language, or in a role-playing game, if they're bothered by very serious, possibly violent content in a role-playing game, then we can't play the same kinds of games with them. And you'll see groups sort of break apart for that issue. You're playing a role-playing game, starts to go in a dark direction, makes some people uncomfortable, game's pretty much dead at that point. Yeah, that's uh, our friend John Stavropoulos. He has a thing called the X card, right? And pretty much what he does is when he starts in any tabletop RPG, especially at a convention, he takes a white card and he writes a big black X on it, he puts it on the table. And what he says is basically, if anything that happens in this game is bothering you, right, for any reason, you want to go in a different direction, whatever, you just raise this, this X card, right? And with no, you don't have to explain anything or whatever, but it, whatever we were just doing is not cool and we're going to go and do something else. Right? No debate. No so, debate whatsoever. Like you find the puppies. The puppies are totally safe. X card. The cats are totally safe. Like maybe someone has an issue right. with puppies. Now, this obviously is not to everyone's style, but this is an example of a tool if you need to play games with people that you otherwise couldn't, there are, me there are mechanics, there are tools, there are structures you can use to make the games work for people who for whom they wouldn't otherwise work. But they change the game. Mm -hmm. The X card pushes the game in a different direction. Mm -hmm. It can be used to help people with social triggers. It could also be used to keep that guy from talking about pole arms because he's really into pole arms. Pole arms, pole, he's, he's really pushing this game in a pole arms direction. I'm really direction. more into just grease arms these days. Well, technically that's a glaive. I don't know about that. <laughs> Not according to this encyclopedia. I have a feeling I would get X-carded a lot. Right. Um, yeah, but I mean, this it's not just at the tabletop either. I used to play a game called Puzzle Pirates, which is like this little cute MMO where you played puzzles and stuff, right? Back in college days, I played that. Oh, yeah. Right? You, you were like big up in that clan. Yeah, it was, well, it was a crew. Yeah, it was a clan. Puzzle Pirates. You were at the Orange Revolution or whatever. I, oh, it was. You remember? I don't remember it. Scott okay. doesn't remember anything. I don't remember it. I just make things up. And he's like, oh, yeah. yeah. Right. But the person who was in charge of the clan, right? She was this really nice person. She, you know, just took everything was awesome. That's why I was in that clan. But she was kind of a churchy, conservative person. So it's like you couldn't say bad words, even though the Puzzle Pirates as a whole game didn't care, right? If you're in our crew, you had to be, like, all nice and happy all the time. Otherwise, she would just kick you out, right? Uh, all right. So you found the group. You can say fuck all the time, and they don't care. You're all the same age. You live in the same town. Uh, da, da, da. Every one of these slides all the way back. <laughs> so there's a problem. There's a problem in gaming. And you've seen, you've all been in this situation. You've probably been in this situation already at a PAX. You've got to get a tabletop game like Puerto Rico. It takes five players. You've got three players. You're walking over to play. You're looking for two more players to play. You see three people walking up. Two of them seem okay, at least judging books by their cover. One of them, you just know. <laughs> you know. 
And you've all done that dance of how do I get the people I wanted to be in my game in my game without telling the person I didn't want to be in the game to not be in the game. So what you do is you hide, right? You don't make yourself known. You do not advertise your game because there could be trouble, right? There are tons and tons and tons of gaming groups out there that are hiding, right? They're hiding from you. They don't post on the internet, right? This LFG, why is there so much LFG on the internet? Because there's people who have a game aren't, at, aren't going there to get that person into their game. I mean, I go to gaming meetups regularly in New York City. There's a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, there are. And what you'll often see is there's regulars, people show up. Whenever a new person shows up, everyone kind of like checks them out, talks to them, and then you'll see different people over the course of that first night kind of take them aside and be like, yo, dog, we have a private gaming night every other Wednesday at my apartment. Oh, really? Yeah, here's my email address. Let's talk. You should come to the next one. Sweet. They hide the fact that these exist from their parents if they could. They do not want anyone else in this group to know because I've seen this exact thing happen where someone invites someone like that and someone overhears and comes over. Oh, hey, can I come too? Mm, come to what? Your game night. You just gave him an email address like a second ago. Oh, uh, yeah, because he's contacting me about some business or whatever. But Why are you paying attention to my business? But it, was, but it was a game night on Thursday. What? No, on Thursday. I have to go to work late. There's like a big release You're playing out. Dota 2. <laughs> I, I heard you. I work for Valve. <laughs> You've seen this happen. We know it happens. Once, once you get your gaming group, you go off the radar and disappear. How, much, how many of you, especially at PAX, late at night, you get your games together, and then you slip out to a hotel a little early, hide somewhere in a corner, get a table, never leave it. Never bring anyone to it. Maybe it's around the corner from the semi-official tabletop area. Right. There's a guy I met recently playing Netrunner. I'm going to stop bringing up Netrunner, but that's... No, you're not. No, I'm not. Uh, right? I met him playing Netrunner. He lives within walking distance of me. I, it's like five blocks to get to his place. He was playing board games, not at any public meetup, not with us, right? He was a stranger to me. He's a great guy. He's really good at games. He loves board games, right? He has one person he played board games with on Sundays. And they didn't advertise, they didn't try to find new people, they didn't do anything. They were just hiding there, playing their two-person game. One of the guys is moving away, so now I'm going over there. I went over there like twice, that's about it. Right? I don't have time for that. I already have enough game nights. But still, there's a game night that is completely hiding from everybody. Right? There could be people living closer to me than that guy. There could be people in my own apartment building, which only has 12 apartments besides me. I've seen packages show up from, with suspicious, nerdy return addresses. <laughs> to the apartment directly below me. There could be nerds in there. <laughs> but I don't know anyone in my apartment building, right? And I'm not gonna go randomly knock on their door, right? They're hidden nerds. For all I know, they could have as many PAX t-shirts as I have, right? But I don't know them. They're hiding from me. There's no way for me to connect with them, right? That's not weird and awkward and creepy. Now, this happens online in video games, too. Go to any online game, especially games like Counter-Strike, and look at the list of servers, and look at all the ones that have that little lock next to them. The private gaming servers. Sometimes I'll join a Counter-Strike server, I'll start playing, and no one's in the voice chat. I'm in a competitive game, no one's in the voice chat. Because four of the other people on my team are on their private vent server talking to each other and want nothing to do with me. Sometimes the vent server is in the MOTD. You should read that. Yeah. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's not. Yeah. I've got mine, baby. So we've solved all these problems by having money by playing, flying around. By playing into That's RPGs. our burning wheel group. We <laughs> play on the roof of our apartment building in New York City. Uh, we do it. There's there is literally a gaming night every single night in New York City. Any day, if I want to go to a game night, it's there somewhere in the city, somewhere in Manhattan, somewhere in Brooklyn. You, you jelly. You want to you play Netrunner? There's like five meetups all over the place. You some, can play some, Netrunner every night. Some of them are competing meetups. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, but we've got ours, right? But like we've said, we've got ours, so we're hiding. We're not inviting anyone to play games on the roof, right? It's not an open thing. This is a private thing, right? We don't go on the internet. There might be someone in his apartment building looking for a game on that roof, and we're not going to find that person and tell them, hey, it's every other Tuesday. Why did we just tell them it's every other Tuesday? <laughs> <laughs> and the landmarks are going to help them figure out the building, too. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good thing there's a new building going up. There is. That view is going to get blocked soon, so it'll be fine. I don't know if it'll get blocked up from the roof. Depends on how tall that building goes. Well, just move. <laughs> Mr. Vice President. So, there is a reason. At least, this is one of the reasons why everyone's hiding. We're not... Now, this is a delicate subject. 
Right, we're not going to talk about the usual things people talk about, which is how to tell if you're that guy, how to not be that guy. Why that guy to, exists. And how to handle that guy, right? What's interesting to us Try is, not to make eye contact with anyone in particular. Right. Is because that guy exists, whether it, the guy literally exists near you or is just this sort of, you know, imaginary figure. The that concept guy, of that guy. Because the concept of that guy and some real instances of that guy exist in the world... That changes the behavior of all the not that guys, right? Because any random gamer could be that guy that you can't have gaming with you or even near you, right, at any time in your entire life, you have to be cautious. You can't open up, right? If I knew there were no that guys, I'd be like, hey, everyone, come. Come to my house Wednesday night, games. And every, if I knew for a fact everyone who shows up is going to be awesome, that would totally work. And out. again, this is a gender neutral term, to yes. be perfectly clear. It's also kind of relative. Like, there's. There's relativity of that guy. For a lot of people who play their uh, like fun games, I'm that guy. I'm that motherfucker who shows up in Google Glass, a kill toe shoes, who takes a game seriously that was written for three year olds. <laughs> so they see me come and they're like, oh fuck, it's that guy. <laughs> tell him our game's full. The game doesn't even have rules. How can we tell him that? Hey, you wanna play Shaggy? No. They're playing Patty Cake. I'm like, faster. <laughs> So everybody's that guy to somebody. It's not one, two, three, shoot. It's one, two, uh. It's one, two, and. If you get that wrong, get the fuck out of my house. So, <laughs> so you see, but the, the, that guy out there, he, it's the guy who you're trying to play a game. You, you advertise, hey, we're going to start a DD and d night. And, or an anime club. Anything nerdy. It doesn't even have to be just gaming. And of all the people that show up, that guy will show up. And that guy will antagonize the other people in your group and basically destroy the group. It's one person. Ten awesome people. Twenty awesome people. One bad egg can ruin the whole thing. We used to play at a gaming club at RIT, which was huge. The room, like, maybe half as many people as are in this room would show up to this gaming club and just play games. But the, the that guys were on the prowl. And they'd be going around, like, trying to join your game. And they were just, Creepy dudes. <laughs> yeah, and the other thing is because, right, any, a public event is where that guy is most likely to show up because that guy is the most desperate, doesn't have, you know, they don't have theirs, right? They don't have theirs. They're going to the public events, right? They're most likely to be there. You'll probably go to a public event, and sometimes it's 100% that guy. They're not that guy to each other, but they're that guy to you, so you don't go back there again. Like, we used to run an anime club. That'll attract that guy's at about the same rate as a gaming club will. And we would actually post people at the door to engage with that guy, to keep him away from other new people who showed up so they wouldn't think the club was all that guy's, and then they'd get used to coming, and then we'd turn him loose later. Right. <laughs> so but yeah. the problem this presents, to do a game, it's kind of a, like a game theory distribution thing, is that if every group that forms a cohesive group and has theirs goes off the radar and rejects to avoid that guy, then eventually over time you increase the concentration of that guy's looking for games. And the only thing that guy hates more than not playing a game with you is other that guy's. <laughs> so the, but it's the worst for the people who aren't that guy who don't have theirs. Because they're walking around looking for game, all the good people have got theirs and are hiding, right? And it's just to see that guy. And they're terrified so they just stop gaming. They just stop gaming because it's you're not you're not gonna how are you gonna find one of these tiny groups? It's almost impossible. Okay, priorities. So we'll talk a little bit about how some ways to solve this as well at this point. Right. So uh, basically, right, I talked about that torchbearer game that I'm playing on Monday nights. For some people, right, the torchbearer game is not the most important thing. Even if they've got it free on their schedule or whatever, they, their kids are more important. Yeah, that's probably more important. Right? Oh, I've got, you know, I have to take this test and, and study for it because i got to graduate with this doctorate degree. Yeah, it's probably more important. Eh. Eh, okay, sure. Maybe it's a little <laughs> less important than the kids, right? But it's like people have different priorities in life. Not everyone's highest priority is gaming, right? It's very few people who, like us, who say gaming is more important than anything. I will game instead of going to my own wedding. I will game instead of not eating, right? Well, instead of eating, whatever, right? <laughs> but look it's, at PAX. I mean, how many people lined up at the start of PAX for the keynote versus lined up to get into the expo hall versus lined up to go straight into tabletop or versus straight Versus the in... Albatross Theater for the fancy panel, Yeah, right? Everyone's not got so a, fancy. People, when people have a different priority, the game is this important or not that important, you can't get together with them because they put something else ahead of the game, right? I can't play right now. I've got to do something else. 
right? So what's the moral here? Just put gaming at the top? If you seriously need game, you have to put gaming at the top. You have to put gaming above other things, otherwise it will never happen, right? It's already so hard to find game, right? You have to make it, if you want it to happen, you have to sacrifice something else. Something, right? Same thing. Schedules and lives. It's so, Even though I, the game is the most important thing in the world to me, right, and the game is the most important thing in the world to Rim, I'm free Monday nights. He's not free Monday nights. Well, That's it. So how did we get ours? A little example. One, if you can, go to a nerdy college or live near a nerdy college. Because nerdy <laughs> colleges, the game, like I said, the gaming club had a lot of, like a number of people similar to the number of people in this room. And there were multiple other competing gaming clubs. We formed a posse of like 20 people. We called ourselves the front row crew. We even named ourselves at one point. And once we That's got our ours, website. Go to it. even at RIT, we would break into buildings and game in like lecture halls so we could use the big screens. So we could use the big tables, the big whiteboards. We would have private secret events in the tunnels for ourselves. And college is the place where we could do that because we never went to class. Priorities. <laughs> we didn't have anything on our schedules. College. Everyone had the same amount of money. College. One summer, we Everyone played, was in the same place. College. We played a board game called Puerto Rico five to ten times a day. Every day. For like three months. Skill level was the same. No air hockey problem because everyone's playing it five times a day. Yep. We would buy a board game and play it hundreds of times. Every time. We'd get... Smash Brothers came out. We just played it every day. I would skip and class. And we still sucked compared to the real players. Yeah. <laughs> I'd skip class, come home to the apartment, play in a game. Scott's playing the same game. We'd play for like four hours. He'd skip his next class. Suddenly it's midnight. Our other friends come over. We keep playing. Infinite gaming. Mm -hmm. Goodbye, pie. <laughs> All gone. Yeah, you eventually have to leave college. Right. So, here's, here's the solutions, people. All right. Live in a city. A real city, not Boston. <laughs> Boston doesn't even have a million people. New York, we've got like 12 just in the city, not even counting the metro area. The it's a real city. Real cities are as follows. London, Paris, Tokyo, Beijing, New York, LA. That's about it. Melbourne, Melbourne, Melbourne in Australia's got like 5 million people. It's actually a pretty serious. Not bad, city. not bad, Melbourne. But seriously, You're there. Toronto is okay because Toronto actually has like has snakes and lattes. It's yeah, okay. It has a, Toronto has a community, <laughs> Vancouver has a community, Seattle has a community, right? But the but population is not high. If you live in a major metropolitan area, there are so many gaming groups and so many gaming meetups that you'll never even see or know exist unless you live there. Because they kind of stay off the radar unless you live in the city. Nerd NYC is called Nerd NYC. And yet they run conventions in New York just for people who live there. We just play games. We show up, we have a weekend convention, tiny packs, just us. Right, I mean, like I said, we're playing Netrunner every night in New York City, but I see posts on the internet in the Netrunner communities I'm in Kansas, can't find game. It's like, yeah, you're not going to find game in Kansas. <laughs> it's just not going to happen, guys. Okay. More conventions. Who here, right, is this the only convention you go to? Who goes to a lot of conventions? Yeah, not a lot of you, right? Go to at least these four. Well, VGG Con's kind of far away in Texas, right? But we go to every PAX, we go to MAGFest every year, we run panels department at Kineticon, and that's only like the beginning of the conventions we go to. If you need a lot of game and you make it a high priority and you're fortunate <laughs> enough to have money, just keep going to cons. There's plenty of them. They're and every if you weekend. live in a major metropolitan area, there are like 19 gaming conventions within a hour and a half drive of our apartments. Yeah, if I want to go City. to like New York Comic Con, I can just take the subway there. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a problem. <laughs> Um, better internets. Internet right? needs to be faster. Well, in the U.S., internet sucks, right? So you can move to Europe. If you're really, if you're big on the internet gaming, move to Europe, and the internet gaming will be better, right? But in the U.S., the internet is garbage. Uh, you got, and, you know, you have to push, like, your representatives to get better internet to smack down on the cable companies, right? If Comcast merges with Time Warner, we're screwed. We're just hosed. I'm not even joking. We're going to yeah. have shitty internet for like decades, right? If they don't merge, what will probably happen is Time Warner will become like T-Mobile and give everyone the finger and we'll get fast internet from T -Mo uh, Time Warner, at least. Maybe. For a little while. For a little while, hopefully, right? So this is a serious like big issue, right? But if you have better internet, the latency issues go away. More people will be, you know, with less money will be able to get faster internet, right? Uh, and it'll be all good. So don't try to read that comic, but... <laughs> Obligation. This is this. Uh, I think some of the problems that get caused in gaming is that when that guy tries to join your game, no one's ever honest. 
our culture of gamers is very open, and that's a very good thing, but as a result, we're very unwilling to express why we don't want to play games with someone, or even that we don't want to play. Sometimes, I want to play a game of Puerto Rico, this board game, with five people who already know the rules and are already super skilled at it. So it shouldn't be offensive to someone who doesn't know the rules if we want to play one game of this by ourselves, but at, there's, almost, there's no safe way to tell someone that the way our gaming Sorry, culture is. Sorry, I don't want to play the game with you because you don't know how to play, and I only want to play with people who are really good at it. That's and, seen. And are very fast in their turn. That's a pretty jerky thing to say. Imagine if I was sitting there with an empty spot at my table, LFG, you came and you wanted that seat, and I told you no because you weren't good at this game yet, and you didn't know the rules. But as a result... I'm a, I'm a jerk if I say that, right? I can't say that. One, we have a lot of people who, who are denied games but never really get an explanation as to why. And two, a lot of us end up playing games out of obligation. You get into a game, the game is bad. Everyone's slow. It's, you know now that this 10-minute game is going to take four hours of your packs away. And our gaming culture says don't walk away from the game. What if I'm in the middle of a, yeah, I'm in the middle of a game with, with some people and it's going great and then it's suddenly not going great? If I get up and leave, I'm ruining the game for all those people. Even if I have a legitimate reason for getting up and leaving, and suddenly I'm the jerk, right? It's like, no, if there's that guy in this game that I didn't know about, I absolutely should get up and leave, and they should know the reason why. Right? We need to be a little more honest as a gaming culture with each other we, about what our goals are, what we want out of games, and we need to be a little more honest with ourselves and be willing to walk away from a game that's not going well. Adapt yourself. <laughs> Right. So, you saw all the slides earlier, right? I play Street Fighter, he plays Tekken. Just change what you're playing, right? If it's that hard to find a game, right, because your friends are playing, you play Pathfinder, they play D&D. I mean, sure, they're being stubborn, they won't change and try a different game. Okay, I agree with you, they're stubborn and narrow-minded people who won't change what game they're playing. But what's easier to do? Get them to change their mind when they're really stubborn, or just go with the flow? You won't convince right? someone to play an indie RPG like Burning Wheel by beating them over the head with it. You gotta play D&D with them first, yes. and then sneak it on in along the side. My friend, other Scott over here, was just telling me before he came in, like, he wants to play Burning Wheel, but he, what's he in? He's in a Pathfinder game. Why? Because it's better than no game. Right? If you're playing League of Legends and everyone else is playing Dota, just play Dota. It's not going to hurt you. Right? It's almost the same. Same vice versa. If all your friends are playing League of Legends, play that. Right? It's better than not playing. Anything is better than not playing and crying in your home. Alone. <laughs> so we are not going to be able to take any questions, obviously. On purpose. <laughs> so... If you enjoyed this at all, if you want to have a follow-up conversation, you want to see videos of this, maybe to show that guy, or many other uh, panels that we've done, lectures over the years, we got little tiny cards here instead of big flyers that actually link you directly to our YouTube channel. We produce a lot of content in MP3 and YouTube form, as, many, as well as many other forms, and you can see it for free all over the internet if you have nothing better to do. And when we sadly gaming, probably won't have time to play a game with any of you. Uh... That's it. Enjoy your packs.